And you're very welcome to another edition of the program. Today we're coming to you from Kells, uh, a wonderfully picturesque and historic village in South County Kilkenny. Actually, as you enter this idyllic place, you're sort of embraced by the historic atmosphere of the area. In fact, the ruins of the Augustinian Priory just outside the village uh, make up uh, the largest, uh, certainly uh, the most impressive monastic site anywhere in this country. And the people of Kells are putting huge effort into ensuring that that, that history and that archeology span is preserved and presented. And while we're on the subject of history, the word Kells comes from the Irish Canonus, which means head, seat or residence. And it was once home to an old Irish high king who drowned in the King's River, which is here behind us and which flows through the village. And actually, the King's River had a very, very important part to play in the development of this beautifully scenic village. <laughs> The King's River was important to the settlers all through the centuries um, because it was used for many things, from transportation to power. But we mustn't forget at that time, lots of people had to travel by the river itself. We hadn't roadways as we see them today. At the initial stage, it was mainly ecclesiastical settlements we see along the river. We have the Kells Priory which was settled in the 10th century by the Augustine monks, who subsequently opened up a mill and a brewery, brought people into the area. As we move back up along the river towards Callan itself, we have several churches, again on the river, which brought the people closer to the river. It was like as if the river was a magnetism and drew the people to it. the life of the mill to have a wheel turning and even to look at a wheel turning and to smell the water is something you just cannot get out of your system. <laughs> Beautiful, yeah. Well, following on from the ecclesiastical era of the, the river itself, economically it came into force uh, by the growth of the mills. Reason being like the land was suitable to the mills for growing corn, growing flax. And um, from that reason, like, the river itself grew, both in statue and in people. And that's why we see so many mills on the river itself. Namely, we have no less than 16 stretching on a very short, even though the river itself is 26 mile, in 14 to 16 mile length of the river, we have no less than 16 mills. Main production in the mill was flour, oats and barley. That was the main production line. But subsequently, some of the mills actually turned into sawmills um, due to the, the availability, if you like, of the mill wheel, which generates the power for such. The mills on the Kings River are mostly in bad repair, but can be repaired, Do you know, and um, it's a pity. They're, you, can, you can generate electricity from these wheels, which is, would be a great idea. You know. There's a very bright future for the river, from a few points of view, mainly because of its fishing, uh, its canoeing, its swimming. But also there's a very historical interest in the river itself. One can start from the very beginning to the very end of this river, and there's nothing but historical sites, monuments to be seen including the mills. A visitor coming to Kells can have a very interesting day. For instance, we have the Mill Museum here behind us, which is a good starting point for Kells. In 1995, the, the, the committee, which then was called Crete, got the opportunity to purchase the mill because it had come on the market. The owner at the time, Mrs. Lexside, decided to sell it. And we saw, first of all, a need to preserve it for future generations and to preserve it as part of our local heritage. Also, the potential was there to create a mill museum, which is now in place in the mill. It's had several effects on the community because it's been used <coughs> as, as um, a, a museum for both locals and tourists to visit. Um, we have a nice picnic area at the front. There's some nice picnic benches, which, which is used quite often for 
both locals and tourists to picnic. The pond is used quite a bit for swimming and for canoeing. The mill itself is used for various functions. It's used for, it has been used for Holy Communion parties, it has been used for retirement parties. Every August we have a major sculpture exhibition in Kells and the mill is used to house the fringe events of the exhibition, i.e. paintings, crafts, coffee shop, that type of thing. And it's a nice place to visit there's, and it's, there's a lot of our heritage there and it's, it's preserved as it was since, since the day the mill was closed really. Just down river we have Kells Priory, which is a 12th century Augustinian Priory. A beautiful, beautiful uh, national monument. Uh, it's the jewel in the crown, without a doubt. Up the road we have Kilree High Cross, we have the High Cross, uh, we have the Round Tower. So within 10, 15 minutes of, of Kells there are lots of uh, archaeological and historical sites and certainly a good day out for somebody who wants to get out into the countryside and see some good heritage, archaeology and history. This is a most beautiful setting. I'm standing here outside one of the oldest houses in the village and the person who lives in there is actually an artist. Now right next door in this beautiful house as well is another artist but believe it or not that's not the only thing that these two men have in common. They're both men of the cloth. I believe they're around the back in a most beautiful back garden having a cup of coffee so I'm going to go and see where they have my name in the pot as well. Isn't this just beautiful, sitting, having coffee in glorious sunshine in a lovely garden and uh, it's something else I've noticed that you guys have in common is that you're both called John. So first yeah. of all, Father, Father John Reynolds, you're originally from Manchester, so how did you end up being retired here next door to Canon John Flynn? Well, like many people, I have Irish roots, mother's from Tralee. And then uh, the work that I did in England entitled of meeting lots of priests uh, living in London and uh, they came over here and found a house for me when my time of retirement was come. Mm -hmm. Our house. So you, you actually... We actually own the, own the, own the <coughs> cottage yes, next right. door, yeah. yeah. And yeah. how long have you and Diane been living here? Well we've been here for 20, nearly 25 years now and um, very happily and we bought the house next door and when John came to settle it we just all clicked together and there he is when one and a half bedrooms and a kitchen and a small living room. And I'm the best tenant he's ever had. <laughs> he pays his rent. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. Well, you do seem to be good friends, and it must therefore be nice that you both have that common interest with, um, you know, the artistic. Now, I know they're very different disciplines. Um, Can and John, yours is I'm landscape. Just, yeah, landscape and still life and occasional portraiture and that sort of thing. And yours then, the, the icons. Father John, that's mm. a, a totally different oh, kettle of fish. Yes, sacred sacred images. Mm. How did you yes. become interested in that? Well, uh, I got a book from somebody for my 60th birthday on icons, and I thought they were strange, a bit otherworldly. And when I came to retire, I thought I, I wanted something uh, significant and fulfilling to do. So I, I went into it seriously, took the courses, and, how to, how to paint uh, or write icons, as we say. Mm -hmm. And uh, here I am, mm. years later. I think the apprenticeship is 15 years and I've just com concluded it. And for you then, Canon John, um, it seems to <clears throat> me, you know, a more pleasurable, which is probably the wrong word, but, you know, easygoing, uh, Discipline oh yes, well, but John takes enormous pleasure and fulfilment out of his paintings, I, I, as I do too. Yeah, um, I, I can't paint. I don't paint very long, a couple of hours a day is about all I can manage. But um, oh yes, an enormous pleasure mm -hmm. out of it. Yeah. And still life is another interest of yours, isn't it? Well, still life is, <clears throat> is grand because they're there. You can leave them set up, and you can you know go back to it time and time again and polish it up and so on. Yes, still life. I like still life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, while Mary was chatting to those talented artists, I've taken a wander down to the Augustinian Priory, a wonderfully impressive monastic settlement dating back 
to 1193. And the man who knows all about it is a Kilkenny man, uh, a, a senior archaeologist with the Department of the Environment, Heritage and Local Government, Con Manning. Con, uh, 1193, how did it all start out? Why the Augustinians? Why here? Well, the Augustinians um, were often chosen by, chosen by the, the Normans uh, as you know, the people to bring into a new monastic house when they were founding a new manor, a new town, etc. Uh, sometimes it could be Cistercians, but Augustinians were very suitable and they didn't have to give them too much land. Sometimes they gave them tides instead of land. So Geoffrey Fitzrobert wouldn't have been the founder of this monastery, wouldn't have been in the first league of lords so he could afford to do an Augustinian house. And why did it become so big and so important? It's vast. Well, it had quite a lot of land and they would have been wealthy enough from all the tides, etc. So it was a prestige monastery. And the thing that strikes you immediately is that there are defensive walls and towers. Why a monastery? This was more in the later medieval period where the, there was no resident lord anymore here in Kells and the, the monastery and their tenants had to look to their own defence. So this is why you're getting all these towers built. <laughs> now, the work that's going on here, you started with the walls? How, how long ago? Yes, work has been going on here since the 1960s, on and off a bit. And then there was excavation done in the 1970s. I worked on the excavations here as a student. Yes. Now, you were showing me that at, at one point there, the, a toilet block, but it was quite sophisticated. There was water running through. Yes, there was a, a, a major monastic sewer running through this site. Yeah, yeah. And we got some wonderful material there, including a lovely bronze jug that's in the National Museum on display. And how did it uh, come to an end then? The, oh yes, the, the monastery came to an end under Henry VIII. The general dissolution of the monastery is about 1540. And they were dispersed? They were dispersed and it was granted to the butlers, in fact, the, the, the lands and the, the monastery itself at that time. Now, was it ever actually attacked or burnt or anything, or did it simply decay? It decayed over time. It would have been used by the tenant of the butlers for a couple of hundred years, probably. And we got evidence of that. And th there's obviously a very extensive work going on now. What, what, what's the job in hand? What's the aim? The job in hand is conservation of the buildings, keeping them standing, what remains of them, so that people can understand them when they visit here, because it's open here all the time. They're also restoring one of the towers. It's called the Prior's Tower. Probably the Prior lived there in later medieval times. And that's being restored as a place where some of the carved stone can be safely kept. So that will be roofed? Mm. That will be roofed and floored, yeah, and the work is in progress at the moment. So it will become uh, possibly a visitor centre, a local resource? A local resource, certainly, that could be open, you know, and by arrangement. Could you ask for a more relaxing place to be, strolling by the King's River in picturesque Kells here in County Kilkenny? And I'm having a chat now with Michelle de Bruyne, who's been living here for how long, Michelle? Well, probably close to 10 years now. And what made you choose Kells? Um, well, I, one of the, the first things that I remember as a child is putting my nose to the window, going through the streets of Dublin, looking at all the old Georgian houses. Um, and I, ever since I can remember, I wanted to live in an old house. Um, I lived abroad for a long time. And when my husband and I decided to come back to Ireland, he wanted to live by a river. We came along here, saw an old house by a river, and that was it, fell in love. Really? Yeah. And what do you like about living in Kells? It's a, it's a beautiful place to live. It's very picturesque mm. here. Uh, we're living right on, on the river. So it, in terms of, we, we have two young children now. So it's just something wonderful for the children. But with your career now, Michelle, mm. uh, you spend a, a fair amount of time on the road, don't you? Because um, you are a barrister. I am, yes. Uh, so that's that's a lot of time on the road to Dublin, is it? It is. I mean, I, I probably spend half my time running around the circuit here, the southeast circuit, and oh, then right. uh, the other half of the time in the in the forecourts. And as a barrister, say, standing in a courtroom, does the fact that you're a famous person and that people, you know, are very familiar with you from your swimming days, um, does, does that kind of hinder or help? Do you get people nudging and saying, oh, there's Michelle Smith? The odd time, but it's, it's funny that, in fact, because I, we're in all of the garb um, in the gown and I actually wear a wig. And 
when you wear a wig, an awful lot of people don't actually recognise you. And sometimes it's only when I take the wig off that people, that you, the penny actually drops. So quite a lot of the time, the wig hides the face. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Who'd have thought that people <laughs> would be wanting to wear those legal wigs and that it would, it would uh, serve a purpose? And the other thing that I remember um, from your time at the Olympics, uh, Michelle, is that you used to do some interviews at Skylge. At Skylge, yeah. And so, well, some of you are going to go to Skylge? Yes, yes. But I didn't know how to do it, but I didn't know how to do it. 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 On the show, in Yov, in the night, all in show. The photos. Of course, we're all familiar with images of the White House in Washington, one of the great iconic buildings of the world. What is probably less well known, however, is that it was actually designed by a Kilkenny architect, one James Hoban. Uh, he also, incidentally, designed the rectory here in Kells behind me. And the man who knows all about him is Dr. Patrick Crowley. Dr. Crowley, uh, how did um, Hoban make it all the way from Kilkenny to uh, America? Well, he uh, went from Kilkenny to Dublin and trained in Dublin. He got the prize in his year and uh, was involved in the building of the City Hall in Dublin and also the Customs House, but then emigrated in about uh, 1780 to America. So would he, would he have come of a privileged family then? Yeah? Well, his, his father was the manager of Lord Desert's estates in this area, this immediate area, and uh, he was a Catholic and Lord Desert paid for his education. We don't know why, but I mean, the thing is, he did pay for it, we know that, and uh, he was an exceptional student. And uh, so having arrived in America then via Dublin, um, how did he make his name there? Well, he first uh, went to Charleston in Virginia, where he designed a number of buildings, including the courthouse, I'm told, and George Washington was passing one day and he admired the building and asked uh, to meet the architect who had designed it and in so doing he met James Hoban. He then persuaded him to enter the competition for the design of the White House, which had a prize of $500, so that was a big, or a gold medal. He won it hands down, there were 19 entrants, and he took the gold medal. And he subsequently went to Washington uh, there were a thousand people approximately in Washington then, mostly construction workers, and he lived there until 1831 when he died and was the first citizen of Washington for most of those years. So he gave us one of the, the best known buildings in the world, the Kilkenny Man. He did, he designed and built the White House. He also built the Capitol, which people are not that familiar with. Now back here in Kells then, another building, he, he designed a Rossanara House, which became the home of Sir John Lavery. That's right, yeah, Rossanara House, which is a few miles south of here, was also uh, built to a design by Hoban uh, in approximately 1800. And uh, in, in the 1920s, uh, Sir Lady, Our Lady Lavery's daughter, Alice, married Jack McHenry and came to live in Rossanara House in, the, in this area, yes. And the Lavery connection is still there in Kells to this very day because Sir John Lavery passed away in Rossanara House, which was owned uh, by his daughter Alice. And Rossanara Stud, where we are right now, is uh, still run by uh, John McEnery, a great uh, great grandson of Lady Lavery. Yes, very proud of it. Um, she, she, was a, she was a great lady, both in, even for the country and for her husband's art. Um, she was the lady on the pound. He was asked to paint what he thought he should paint for the Irish pound at the time, and he said he'd paint the most beautiful woman in Ireland, so he painted his wife. So, so she, she's become an icon of Irish history. That's it. And until the euro came in, she, her watermark was always on the, the, the Irish note. So. Now, John, um, as I said, we're, we're on the stud here, and you've had some great winners over the years. Yeah. Well, my father has... Um, bread red rum here and um, when I came home from college I thought it was going to be a, an easy job because I got off to a flying start. I bred um, a horse called the Deputy and a horse um, who won the Santa Anita Derby and I won a Royal Ascot or um, yes a Royal Ascot winner, Hal Mahira and um, I thought it was going to be easy and the next minute then it took nearly 10 years to breed another group performer so that's, that's horses. 
How often have we sat in a church and admired the beauty of the stained glass windows? It's an art form that dates back almost a thousand years, but many stained glass artists continue that tradition in Ireland today. And Helen McInerney met one of them here in Kells. When you visit Joe Sheridan's stained glass studio in Kells in County Kilkenny, you are struck by the detailed preparation and painstaking work involved in the stained glass process. Joe's late father, John Sheridan, set up the business in 1980, and since then, their reputation as skilled craftsmen has ensured a thriving business. It's a very, very slow process, there's no doubt about it, and it is a lot of, it's, it's, it's attention to detail from start to finish. First of all, we do a design, and uh, when we have the design completed, and if the client is happy with the design, then we would do a full-size drawing or a cartoon. Um, when the cartoon is done, then we would cover our cartoon down with uh, tracing paper, and we would draw our lead lines on the tracing paper. And from that, then we would, we would pick our colours and our textures of each piece of glass. This can be a very slow process because colour is, is, is very important in stained glass. And when we have the colours actually picked and types of glass picked, we would number each piece of glass individually and we would, we would also number the drawing. At that stage, then we would actually take the drawing down and we put it on our bench and then it is ready to, to actually cut each piece of glass individually. Over the years, the business has changed, and while once they did a lot of work for hotels, today they concentrate on the restoration of existing windows and new windows for churches, cathedrals and convents. Joe has a workshop in nearby Stonyford. Stained glass windows have, they, they have a life a span of, it varies from around maybe 80 years to maybe 130 years. At that stage, the window between weather and age the windows may need to be removed and to be restored and uh, that's the type, a lot of the type of work that we would do. This window here now was vandalised and we actually removed the windows but luckily enough we were able to salvage a lot of little pieces of glass that was actually broken out of the window. So what we'd actually do is we would uh, assemble all the little pieces together again, uh, glue them back together and from them pieces of glass that would tell us exactly what the original piece of glass looked like. So we would be able to match colour and the design. You do need to be artistic, no doubt, uh, and you also need to be, you know, you need to be good with your hands as well, because there's, a, a, I suppose, the majority of it is artistic, but the actual leading and the soldering and the finish of the product, um, it, 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 does, it does take people with good, good hands as well that they can, um, they can produce a, a quality product at the end of the day. The leading process is um, it's similar to a jigsaw and each piece of glass is surrounded by lead. And it, the lead comes in, in a H section and it's quite flexible and you can, you can bend it and shape it around each piece of glass. And each piece of glass is surrounded by lead and uh, as I said, it's like a jigsaw. By the time you surround each piece of glass with lead, you can then use solder the joints and then the panel. Joe employs five people and business is booming, which is good news for Joe Sheridan and his team. We have an awful lot of work on at the moment. Uh, I'm fortunate probably to say that we probably have uh, work to keep us going for the next seven to eight months. So it, business is very good at the moment. Wonderful use of light and of colour there. And that brings us to the end of the programme for this evening. We do hope you've enjoyed our visit to Historic Kells in County Kilkenny. And you know, if you get a chance over the summer, you really should come and visit the Priory. It's very, very impressive. Absolutely wonderful. Yeah. We'll be back with you on Wednesday. And until then, from Kells and from all of us on your Nationwide team, good, good evening. evening.